So uh, let's begin, I think. Yeah? Okay. So hi, my name is Daniel, and thanks for having, having me here, and thanks for coming. Uh, as the title suggests, we're going to talk about how we as Scala developers can share our thoughts uh, with the compiler, and how, uh, what can we gain in return for, for this uh, act of sharing. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I want to make a quick uh, introduction, which will hopefully get us in the, in the right uh, mood, let's say. So uh, way back when, when you maybe started doing Scala, so you uh, started experimenting in the, maybe in the REPL, and you typed up something like val x equals, equals 1, and you hit enter, and you get this result. And you look at it, and you see, well, I never said it was an int, but the compiler kind of figured it out on, on its own that this is supposed to be an int. And it's kind of magic. I didn't say anything. The compiler got me, and it's, it's nice when the compiler actually understands uh, what you're doing. So you think, OK, I'll do something more advanced. Um, and then you write something like an if-else. So here we have two branches. On one branch, we have a sum. On the other, we have a none. And in Scala, those are, these are two different types. And yet, when you hit enter, you get a reasonable result. result. The compiler figured out that sum and none uh, are not the, sp the specific types that you want, and that you actually want an option. And so, so it unified the two, the two branches, uh, branches into a single reasonable result, which is, again, uh, quite, quite nice. And at this point, you maybe have this kind of feeling that you are one with the machine. So it kind of gets you, you get the machine, everything kind of works, and it's great. And it's a nice feeling. Uh, too bad that it doesn't last too long. Um, but whatever, so we continue with our journey. So now you're trying to experiment with JSON. So you pick some your favorite JSON library. And you write something like this. So you write uh, an int as a JSON and converts it to a JSON in the reasonable way, so where everything works. Then you do something more advanced. So we try to take an optional value uh, and convert it to a JSON. And again, it works just as expected. And so you think, OK, uh, options and tries are kind of similar. So uh, an option has a value or doesn't have a value. A try has a value or doesn't have a value. So we try to do this, and the compiler screams at you. Something unreasonable. You have no idea what it means. But you, you, know, you quickly give up because you don't really care at the moment. You just convert it to an option and just you know, move along. Maybe you're slightly disappointed, but you know, whatever, it works in the end, somehow. And so now that you know JSON, you're ready to write your first uh, serious business app. Uh, so it's a big step. You're kind of you're hoping that everything will be OK, and you deploy it to production. But much later during the night, someone, somewhere you get this. Uh, so an exception, and you're trying to debug it. So like in, in the middle of the night, it's all panicked and, and terrible. And uh, after ho hours of debugging, you find that the signature of fetch post was, is this. And you can see here that we mixed up the order of the arguments. So uh, post ID and feed ID are supposed to be reversed here. And, and you're even more disappointed, because why didn't anyone stop you? It's kind of a silly mistake to make. I mean, if there is a compiler here trying to kind of help me, why is it, didn't, didn't it catch this little mistake here? And so by this point, the image of the compiler kind of changes. So on the one hand, it's this terrible monster trying to block you from doing whatever you're trying to do. Uh, with incomprehensible error messages and, and whatever. But on the other hand, it's kind of dumb. It's, it's not actually helping you doing something useful. I mean, the, the mistake on the previous slide was, was quite obvious. Why didn't it catch it and do something more reasonable? Instead, it was this dumb robot, which th that doesn't really help you. So my claim for this talk is it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, and what's missing uh, in, in, in these examples is communication. So. We're not communicating, communicating enough between uh, us. There's not enough communication between us and the compiler. And so if we share our thoughts with the compiler, we might, uh, we might make the compiler more helpful and useful for our development process. And in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, three, three methods of communication. So types, implicits, and macros. So each one uh, of, the, uh, of these uh, three methods provides us with a way to share our thoughts with the compiler. And we'll see that we actually gain, gain something in return. So so once the compiler actually understands our intents, it can participate in the development process and actually help us do, uh, do reasonable stuff. OK, so we start with uh, types. So Scala is somewhat famous or maybe infamous for, for its type system. Um, uh, so, but we'll see with simple examples, I won't be doing anything advanced here, uh, that th they can be quite useful, and specifically for the purpose of communicating intent to the compiler. So for the purpose of this talk, types are compiler-verified facts. 
Okay, the ty types are more than that, but for this this talk specifically. So uh, each occurrence of a type is, is a fact that you state to the compiler, and, and the compiler can keep track of this fact and, and verify the consistent usage uh, of this fact. For example, if I state that something is an int, the compiler, compiler will make sure that I always use it as an int. Um, as a consequence, the more types we have in our program, um, the more consistency checks can uh, uh, the compiler can provide for us, and the more precise our types, the more useful the checks will be. Um, and now, since Scala's type system can be quite so sophisticated, we can actually express very advanced uh, facts about our code using types. So we start with something simple, not nothing advanced. Um, so here's the example from the from the pre previous part. So this is the function uh, that uh, caused us uh, a bug in production during the night. Uh, and it does have types, like we, we said, int, 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 and th there are types here, but th these types are not, are not descriptive enough. So we have three, three different kinds of IDs, but all of them are typed as int. So now, the problem here is that the compiler doesn't know that this int and this int are two different concepts. So it doesn't keep track of them as separate entities. Entities, So it's all the same thing. So it doesn't care if we mix up the two things because it doesn't know that they're different. So the type here is not sufficiently descriptive. Uh, but... Um, we can make it slightly less dangerous to use, so we can use named arguments. So Scala provides a nice syntax for calling methods with named arguments. And so in this, this way, it's kind of easier to keep track of what's going on. So I won't be mixing up feed ID and post ID or, or anything else, because order doesn't matter anymore. I just can name them, and it's, it's easier. But it's not actually a solution to our problem, since uh, named arguments are actually just a local piece of knowledge. That we, we're saying to the compiler, here in this context, this number is an app ID, but it doesn't really know about app IDs in general. So if I want to ask the compiler something like, where are all the app IDs in, our, in, in my code? Well, the answer is, I don't know, there are ints somewhere. Some of them are called app ID equals something, but it's, it's not a rule. It's not something the compiler can actually help us keep track of. So to actually solve this problem and to make, to make our, our intent more clear and to communicate to, compi to the compiler what, what we're doing, we're going to introduce um, typed wrappers. So these are just small case classes that just wrap each kind of int that, uh, that we want to provide. So now we have app ID, post ID, and feed ID as, as distinct types. Uh, so now we told the compiler that we have three separate concepts in our system. Okay? Each type is a new concept, and, and the compiler will keep track of this concept and the use, usage of, of each concept uh, in a consistent way. So, and since uh, Scala syntax for wrappers is quite minimal, it's actually it's a very light way to just spread around the, the, these little wrappers all around the code, and it's one of the most, I think, useful things i ever done in a code base. And it's not monads, it's not, not applicative, it's just little wrappers all around the code. Um, though monads and applicatives are useful as well, obviously. Um, and so uh, now we can actually rewrite our function from before. So now uh, if we look at the type signature, so we have three different types for each argument. And just reading the type signature makes it very apparent uh, what we're dealing with, which is nice. But what's more important, the compiler now knows that these are three distinct entities. And now it will keep track uh, of the consistent usage of these, uh, of these three entities. So if I try to reproduce the bug from before, I get a compilation error. Oops, sorry. Uh, I get a compilation error. So uh, in this case, we communicate the comp to the compiler what, what we want to do, what, what different type of types of IDs we have. And now the compiler uses this knowledge to, to warn us about the mistake. In this case, the, the error message is even, is even quite readable. So it's telling us you've mixed up the two arguments. So, um, so this is the, an, an immediate benefit of, of communicating and sharing our thoughts with the compiler is, is just the compiler can keep track of things for us, which we might forget. Um, in general, uh, I find that using small wrappers is, is very, very uh, useful. So there are a number of benefits that uh, you can gain, gain from this. Uh, first of all, you can search by type. So if I want to ask my, uh, my uh, code base, where, where are all the usages of application IDs? Well, it's easy. Find the usages of this type, and you find all, all the, the places. Now, doing this with an int would be almost impossible, because you, you'll have no idea what ints are special and what are not. Um, so, uh, so when a type becomes compiler knowledge, it can actually be shared back with us and help us do, uh, achieve various goals. Also, refactoring becomes simpler. So suppose that you, you need to uh, convert application IDs from ints to longs, or maybe you need to add, uh, add the metadata to, to the application ID. Well, if you have an int, good luck finding all the ints. But if you have a special, a special wrapper, you just change the type, find all the compilation errors, fix them, and you're done. The compiler actually helps you track the, track the refactoring and make sure that you're doing it safely. 
Uh, and the last point is about customization. So since we're uh, dealing with specialized types, we can add specialized behavior for, for our specific types. For example, if application IDs cannot uh, ever be negative, we can add a special smart constructor that constructs that only constructs application IDs if, uh, if, if, the, uh, if the number is not negative. Or for example, if we need to have a special serialization format, so our JSON format is supposed to be hashed or something, or we need to encrypt something, so we can actually Tell the compiler, th this is the way you serialize application IDs. And the compiler will keep track of our usage of, of application IDs, won't mix it up, up with ints, and always use the right functions for us. So all of these benefits are, are just free if you just start spreading around, around this, the, these li little wrappers all over the code. Um, OK, so I would like to make a brief interlude, uh, claiming that programming is hard. Anyone agrees? Anyone? No? Oh, almost of you know. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so imagine yeah, yeah, you got your dream job, you're now doing Scala full time. And you think, okay, I'll never, never, ever use any scary language out there. It's, it's, I, I'm doing Scala full time now. That's, that's my only purpose in life now. But then, you know, you're doing a web app and you have something like this. It's quite common to have templates. And if you look at this piece of HTML, essentially, you have three languages here, right? You have HTML, you have JavaScript, and you have this weird syntax for URLs. And now, not only that we have three languages on a single slide, but we also have uh, uh, interpolation of, of arbitrary code inside our, uh, our, co our code snippets. And now, every, every time I interpolate something, I risk code injection, and so it's actually quite unsafe. And there's no one to help me, because there are three languages here, it's all one huge string, and, and it's, that's quite terrible. But since we're into communicating with the compiler, and we just learned about typed wrappers, Let's do this. Let's try to wrap uh, our code in, in some wrappers and try to help uh, make make this whole process uh, safer. So, so we start. Uh, so we have three languages. So we have three wrappers. Okay. So we have HTML code, J JavaScript code, URL code. So each each uh, concept has a new type. That's that, that that was the lesson from the previous uh, example. Okay. But I, I said that we're going to be interpolating interpolating user input into our code. So it might be possible that we have user input, which is possibly uh, unsafe. So we would like to mark unsafe code as being unsafe. So we add more wrappers. So now we have tainted HTML code, tainted JavaScript code, and tainted URL code. So you can't interpolate tainted code because you don't know if it's safe yet. You have to sanitize it. OK, so once you sanitize it, you probably want to have another wrapper for safe code. So now we have safe HTML code, and safe JavaScript code, and safe URL code. OK, but then you have more requirements, for example, um, uh, so we, we might have sensitive data in, in our inputs. For example, we, we don't want to expose in our forms some data about the user. So we would like to have a concept of uh, uh, sensitive data versus uh, anonymous, uh, anonymous data. So we have uh, more wrappers. Um, so we have sensitive tainted HTML code and sensitive tainted... Um, Okay, so if we have sensitive, uh, sensitive data, we also have anonymous data. data. So we have, the clicker is not working. Uh, okay. So we have anonymized data. And now this is obviously getting out of hand. So only the names of these classes are, are, are code smells. So uh, we didn't even try to use them. That, that, that's terrible. That's, you shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's just a mess. Um, and the question is, what's, what went wrong? So I gave you like this advice, use type wrappers, and then I have this. Uh, so the problem here is that we're trying to cram multiple facts into the class name. So each type from the compiler, compiler's point of view is a single concept. But when I say something like sensitive tainted HTML code, I'm saying three things at once, but the compiler has no idea. For the compiler is just a single type name, and it won't be parsing uh, the, 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 the class name to, to figure out what's going on. It's just a single concept. So if I want to ask, where, where are all the instances of tainted code in my, uh, tainted pieces of code in my code base? Well, I don't know. There are three, three distinct types which are tainted. Uh, so sorry, six distinct types which are tainted, and the compiler have, has no idea that tainted code is a single concept. So we're not using this this concept of wrappers well. We're we're abusing uh, the class names just to to provide more more information. So what do we, we actually have to do? We have to communicate to the compiler that we have separate concepts in their system. So we have separate languages, sep separate states of safety, separate states of anonymization. So for this, uh, typed wrappers are not as as well suited as as uh, previously in the previous example so we use a new technique um, called uh, phantom types so i'll i'll explain the name in, in a moment so 
for the uh, so that's how let's say how we actually implement something with phantom types. So we have we said we have the concept of language in in our code base. So we define a trait called language, and we have three subtypes: HTML, JavaScript, and URL that extend language. Now notice that all of uh, all of these definitions are traits, so we have no values. So, phantom, uh, so essentially, th these are just markers for the compiler to keep track of. So they have no purpose at runtime; they are just there for the comp to help the compiler understand what what we are doing. So we're telling the compiler, "This is a concept. Keep track of it." Uh, and that's the reason for the name phantom types. types. It's, it's uh, uh, types without any values, so they don't have any actual existence. Now, for each concept, we'll have to introduce a new phantom type. So now we have co the concept of safety, so safety can uh, either be tainted or safe. And we can do the same thing with anonymization, but I'll save the slide space. And now that we have each concept as a distinct type, we can use this to create a new wrapper, which will be somewhat more usable uh, in the following. So we are wrapping a single string. It's a, it's a piece of code, but now we parameterize with two parameters, one for the language, one th for the safety. So notice that we're not encoding anything in the class name, where we have each concept from our system as a distinct type that the compiler can keep track of. So for example, if I, uh, I read some uh, input HTML, I'm not showing the implementation because it doesn't really matter, we just care about what the compiler is doing. So if I'm reading some HTML code, I mark it as tainted, and the compiler knows this is tainted. You won't be able to do anything unsafe with it. Next, we say, okay, we have a function, uh, sanitize HTML, takes tainted code and converts it into safe code. And ideally, in a real system, that will be the only way to construct safe code, so the, comp the compiler will be able to tell you, you can't do this, you can't convert arbitrary strings into, into safe, you have safe code, you have to actually pass through, through the sanitization uh, function. And then the last part is interpolation, so we say, given that you have H safe HTML code, please interpolate it into a final HTML piece of code. Now, if we actually try to use this, uh, so we read some HTML input, and then we try to interpolate it. The compiler, compiler tells us, well, you try to interpolate tainted code uh, in a place where we, try, uh, we were supposed to use safe code. You're wrong. So as you can see, the compiler actually helps us. With, so uh, helps us track, keeping track of the concept of safety uh, in our code. Uh, that's actually something that we could do with the uh, typed wrappers before, but th there are things that are more complicated. For, exa for example, suppose I want to ask uh, to do something that ignores uh, the safety. So again. So suppose I have a function called, called anonymize that says, okay, for any HTML code, whatever it is, uh, I don't care. I don't care about the safety. I just want to anonymize it. So I, I keep the safety as a parameter, and I just I just treat HTML code. So implementing such a function without duplication using the simple wrappers will be uh, repetitive. In this case, we can just ignore the concept that we don't care about at the moment. So we can separate each concept into into separate. Uh, implementation. If we don't care about it, we can ignore it, and the compiler can can tell us, well, you don't care about safety, hence, hence this is a type parameter. And so if we try to use this function in a legal way, so for example, we try to take a piece of JavaScript, which is safe, but doesn't really matter, if we try to anonymize it, well, HTML and JavaScript are not, not compatible, and you have, you have an, a, an error message that, again, helpfully points out that you're wrong. Uh, so again, by communicating various facts to the compiler, uh, we obtain useful, I think, assistance um, in return. Uh, so to sum up, um, as I said before, uh, Scala's type system is quite rich, and here's uh, just a sample of various uh, type constructs uh, in the Scala language. So each one uh, is enab enables us to express a, a new family of concepts to the compiler, uh, which in return will help the compiler to de more deeply understand our code. And hopefully from the examples uh, on the previous slides, that this will give you actual motivation to explore further ways of expressing yourself to the compiler. So each and one of these topics is very, very useful, and I encourage you to actually uh, dig into them. Okay, so let's move on to implicits. <coughs> So, implicit. Uh, they tend, tend to have a bad name. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, they tend to have a bad name. And sometimes, rightfully so, because it's very, very easy to make a mess with implicits, like this. That's an actual example from code. Um, so here's an example. Uh, please don't do this in real code. So having actually bothered to, uh, to uh, distinguish each uh, sort of uh, type of ID in our system, we had an implicit conversion that takes numbers and converts them to IDs which might be seems like a useful syntax, like you don't have to wrap everything and you just try the numbers and it works. But then we just reintroduced our bug from before. So we kind of, we, we spent effort to teach, teaching the compiler something new and then we just mixed everything up with implicits and the compiler forgot everything. So that's something that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, but what we actually want, uh, what, what I actually want to talk about here is how do you, how, how can you leverage implicits to communicate with the compiler, actually do something useful, not confuse it. So when we don't abuse them, 
Uh, implicits are yet another piece of knowledge that the compiler can uh, we can give to the compiler. But unlike uh, plain types, uh, implicits are so something that the compiler can actually o operate on and actually use them to derive new new knowledge for us. Okay, so so types are kind of static. Implicits are more dynamic. They allow the compiler actually learn new stuff using various rules and facts. Uh, in addition, as we uh, as we'll see shortly, implicits are a connection bet between uh, values and types. And this means that we can, guided by types, create new values that the compiler can, can actually generate for us, and we can use at runtime, and we'll see how, how this is useful. Uh, so let's start with some examples. Um, so simple uh, implicit values are what I'll call facts. So we're telling to the compiler, if ever you need a writer of string, and we're talking about JSON here, if ever, ever, uh, ever you need a writer of string, this is the writer for strings. Okay, you can use that. Um, Next, we have uh, what I call rules. So a rule says uh, is a, uh, typically a def, which says the following. So suppose you know how to write A's. I'll give you a way to write a list of A's. Now, if ever I ask you to write a list of A's, please use this rule to derive a new writer for me. So the compiler, compiler will do this at compile time for us, and we'll see how, how it works later on. Um, and so, so essentially, this is this is the way uh, that the compiler actually can derive new facts for us. Next, we have duration, duration requests. So here we're saying, okay, compiler, I want to write something of type A. Please generate for me the appropriate writer. Okay, provide for me from whatever facts and rules that you know the writer that fits the current A I'm trying to write. So if, you, if I'm trying to write uh, a list of strings, the compiler knows, okay, I know a rule for lists, I know a rule for strings. I'll combine the two, and then I'll write, I do the right thing. Um, so this is uh, the typically uh, a very typical use case for implicits. I I'll wa want to make a brief uh, a pause here and and just complain about names. I think part of uh, the reason why people are kind of afraid of implicits, especially people uh, newcomers uh, to the to the language, is that the word implicit is kind of scary. I mean, something happening in the background there, maybe in C plus plus. I don't know, just something not not right there. And I propose to rename them. I doubt that anyone will accept my proposal. But uh, whenever I come up with my own language, which allows dashes in identifiers, I'll uh, rename them as, uh, I'll, I'll consider renaming them as following. So facts, implicit values, are going to be, to be compiled on facts. So I'm saying, here's a fact about writers. That's the writer of string that I want to provide. Next, we have compile time rules, which say, if you know something about writer of A's, here's a piece of knowledge about uh, writers of list of A's. And then when I do the revision request, I say, okay, compiler, provide me with the right, uh, the, the right value here. So I think with this terminology, it's kind of obvious that we're not just doing implicit magic in the background, we're actually communicating with the compiler. We're stating various facts and rules for the compiler, and the compiler will do something useful with them. Uh, obviously, this is all a bit abstract, so let's do actual examples. Um, so uh, we're trying to implement writers for various bits of JSON. So we start with writing uh, strings as JSON. So the implementation is quite straight straightforward. We just wrap with a JS string constructor, and this is going to be a JSON uh, type that, that we'll use for serialization. So uh, that will. So again, we're saying that this, imp this is implicit, and the compiler will know this implementation is the implementation for writers of string. Um, next. Uh, we're going to uh, define the rule for uh, for lists uh, of A. So we're saying here, if we know how to write an A, uh, we can we know how to write a list of A. How we, how do we do it? We receive the list of A's as an argument. We iterate over each one, use the writer that we know for A's to convert them to JSON, then we wrap the whole thing into uh, into a JSON array. Okay. So now we have a result that, given any A that I know how to write, I can write lists of A. And another example of a, of a rule is how to write options. So given that I know how to write options of A, I know how to write A's, I can write options of A. How do I do that? I get an optional value, I map uh, over it, and if it's a present, I, I write it to JSON, but if it's not present, I, I just retrieve a, a null, a JSON null instead. Okay, so, so this is an example of, of two rules in effect. And how can we actually use it? So here we have a list of options of strings, uh, and now we, we ask uh, the compiler, please write this for us uh, as JSON. And it does the right thing. So some values are converted uh, directly into the strings, and uh, none values are converted to null. That's what we expect. But what's happening behind the scenes uh, is the following. So it, when we ask the compiler to write something, it has to derive the right writer. So what, what it's doing in the background is actually invoking methods and, and values for us. So in this case, the compiler says, OK, you want to write a list of something. So I have a, a rule for lists, so it's list writer. So let's, let's invoke that. 
And okay, the, the inner value is an option of something. I have a rule for options, so let's invoke that as well. So it calls this method. And then what we're, what we're actually writing is strings, and we have a fact that tells us how to write strings. So the compiler invokes that as well. And then this is the, actually, uh, the actual code that happens in the background. Now notice that this code is a code that I didn't have to write. Okay, here on the side I had to, but actually in real code you won't be writing this this code yourself, and so this code that you don't have to maintain. You taught the compiler something; it uses this knowledge to derive new values for you. So it's something that we couldn't do with just plain types. We, we, we're teaching the compiler to derive things for us. Uh, but suppose we miss something, like we did uh, in one of the first slides. So suppose I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to write a, a list of try of string. Okay, so I, I invoke this, and then the compiler gives me a compilation error. Once the clicker works, yeah. Um, so it's telling us that well, it wasn't able to find a writer uh, for a list of tries of strings, uh, and it like actually makes sense. We never taught the compiler how to uh, actually write write tries. So with the uh, in this example, the compiler is trying to say, okay, you're trying to write a list of something. Let's invoke the the rule for lists. But then, okay, how do I write tries? Well, I don't have any rules. I don't have any facts. I fail here, and so the compiler tells us, well, you can't do that. And this serves to highlight how important it is to have good communication. So whatever you didn't tell the compiler, it obviously won't know it by, on, on its own. So you have to teach the compiler the right uh, building blocks to actually do the work for us. Uh, so if you actually wanted uh, it to write tries, we'd have to introduce a rule to, to do that. Now let's uh, kind of step it up a notch just to illustrate the point. Um, so suppose we, we have even more complicated rules. Here I'm saying that uh, I can write tuples, if I can write A and B, I can write a tuple of A and B, which you can imagine the implementation, but I have the full code uh, in a repo, you can see the implementation there. And the same thing goes here, if I want to write an either, so given that I know how to write an A and a B, I can write an either A or B. A or B. So these are new rules that the compiler can play with and, and do stuff with us. And so here's an example of something you, you can but really shouldn't be doing. So here's a type that's so long that it doesn't actually fit on a single line. So we have a list of options of either option, option, or whatever. And so here's the value of this type. Now I say, okay, compiler, please write it. Uh, sorry, please write this as JSON. Well, the compiler says, okay, here, that's the value. Uh, and it works. And it's not any sort of magic. We taught the compiler all the relevant rules. And so what happened in the what happened in the background is this. The compiler invoked this many rules just for, to be able to do, the, to do this. So again, again, this is code that we're not actually writing. The compiler is doing this for us. Uh, again, if you teach the compiler the right facts and rules, it will be able to provide actual values that you can use at runtime for you. Uh, of course, deeply nested types like this are not common, but real nested types with case classes and stuff are, are quite common. So this ability is, is, is useful in real code. So this is not real code. Please. Please don't write it anywhere, and don't blame me if you do. Um, but anyways, okay, so uh, implicits are very common in Scala. There are various techniques that you can leverage to, uh, to do, do stuff with implicits. So what we did here was, uh, was an example of using type classes. Uh, it's a pattern that uses implicits to, to do what we just did. Also, there, there are ways to do dependency injection, which is driven by types. And, those, and if you really want to kind of dig deeper into implicits, there's a library called Shapeless that does very sophisticated stuff using implicits, and you can express very complicated rules and facts uh, using uh, various mechanisms in, uh, in Shapeless. Okay, so let's move on to macros. Um, okay, so macros are very notorious for being hard to write and maintain. Uh, but still, they have have their uses. So, uh, so first of all, what are macros? I guess it's it's not a basic feature in the language. So, so I'm I'm not sure that everybody are are familiar with them. So, let's uh, do a quick recap of what what uh, what a macro does. So, essentially, a macro is a compiler function that takes abstract syntax trees and converts them to new abstract syntax trees. Essentially, it takes code and creates new code for us, and it happens at compile time. So, the compiler is is invoking a function at compile time. Uh, and uh, and produces new code for us. Now, since this is actually regular Scala code, you can invoke arbitrary functions during the expansion of a macro. So you can invoke at compile time any function you want, and it's not unheard of of like calling, calling a database during compilation. Sounds weird, but but does happen. They're still experimental in the Scala language, and probably will be removed in the next major release. So so uh, and it's exactly as dangerous as it sounds. Okay, it's. If you want to use macros, you really should be careful. It's not, not unlike um, this image here, where this truck <laughs> is the compiler, and you're trying to kind of 
you know, do something <laughs> inside, and it's not safe. It's really not safe. Um, so you might rightly ask yourself, why why should I actually use macros? Because you know, I don't want to be dead by truck. Um, so first of all, the answer is it's a last resort. Only when the standard means of communication fails. So if you can do this with types, you can do it with implicits. Uh, then maybe you can consider macros, and even then, maybe it's not the right solution. Uh, so typically, use cases for macros is when so you have some language feature that is missing in the Scala language and, uh, language, and you want to implement it uh, by yourself. So macros sometimes allow to introduce new new features into the language. Or, for example, if you have some boilerplate that would be tedious or error prone to write, and you want uh, to mechanize it using using a macro, for example. So. In the sense, macros are like kind of the ultimate means of communication. You, sort of, you kind of dig in into the brains of the machine and you just teach it new stuff directly in, in its brain. So th there is some power there, but again, it's, it's, it's dangerous. So please take care if you actually implement something. So let's start, start with a relatively simple example. So Skull has a pretty nice support for regular expressions. So we can define a regular expression like this using the dot r syntax. And then you can um, pattern match uh, on the regular expression like this. And that's the right thing. Now, for example, if, if you actually messed up the regular expression, so here I forgot to close the parent, uh, you'll get an exception at runtime, which kind of, it's a bummer. You, know, you don't really want to fail at runtime on something that you could actually verify at compiler time, because this string is actually known during compilation. Why can't I just verify it uh, during compilation to make sure that this is the right syntax? Regular expressions have pretty well-defined syntax, so this should be easy to verify. Unfortunately, Scala, the language, uh, doesn't have any, any way of doing this at compile time. It's just not a feature of the language. And this, uh, this is something that we can try to implement on our own as a macro, and we can do this. So let's start. Uh, what we want is something that runs the, the dot .r function at compile time, and if there are any mistakes, reports the mistakes and aborts compilation. So we want to fail at compile time when we have a, an invalid regular expression. So we start with some boilerplate. Uh, so we, we define the signature that we want to implement. So we say, given a string, you want to provide a regex. And instead of implementing it, we say that this is a macro. This is a reserved keyword in the language. So we're saying you're us using a macro. And the implementation is here. Now, at this point, the compiler, when, he, he, uh, when the compiler sees this invocation, it actually goes to the implementation of the macro and expands it during compile time. So uh, how will the implementation look like? There's lots of boilerplate in macros, and it's all very magical. And I won't be digging, digging into the details, because that's kind of uh, too, too deep. But uh, you start with the declaring that you need a context. This is, some, uh, this is an object that the compiler provides for you that actually allows you to, do, to invoke various pieces of the compiler and, and to actually uh, do non-trivial stuff with macros. And next, you, you imitate the signature that you had before, but, uh, but you wrap everything in expressions. So we have an argument that is an expression of string. Essentially, it's a piece of code that represents the argument that we got for the macro. And the type of that piece of code is supposed to be string. And the result is another piece of code, an expression, that, that is a regex. Now, uh, we start with a magical import that actually makes everything work. Without it, nothing works, and you have no idea what's going on. Um, and then we actually do the implementation. So, so we start by uh, figuring out whether we got an, an actual literal uh, string literal uh, as an argument. So here we're pattern matching on the tree of the. Uh, so we, we have code, and the code is represented as a tree. We want to pat pattern match it uh, on it and to verify that it's, it's an actual literal. So if it's not a literal, uh, we're going to abort compilation. Notice that this is not an exception. This is something that stops compilation before we actually execute anything at all, and we give an error message. Otherwise, we, 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 this branch actually captures uh, string literals. The syntax here, the Q letter, uh, stands for quasi-quotes. It's a way to uh, pattern match and construct uh, pieces of code during compile time. Again, it's, it's, it's quite a deep topic. I won't be going into it. But this is the right syntax to actually, if this uh, succeeds, this, uh, this value is an actual literal that we can use at compile time and, and use that. So now this thing is an actual string that we can use. So if this succeeded, we can move on to the next stage. We have an actual string literal in hand, which we can try to analyze. And so uh, we do the next thing. So we want to convert this literal into a regular expression. But since we're doing everything at compile time, so this is going to run during compilation. We don't want to throw any exceptions here, since an exception here will just crash the compilation pipeline, and that's not what we want. So, so we wrap everything with a try. And if it succeeds, then OK, this, this is a, a valid regular expression. We can ignore it. But if, if it's a failure, we're going to uh, abort compilation again uh, and saying, well, this is not a, 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 a valid regular expression. Here's the, the, the error message that we got. Again, this is compile time, not, not an actual runtime exception. Uh, 
So now that if this succeeded, we can actually return the regular expression. So we have to create a piece of code that stands for what we want. So the Q letter, again, quasi quotes, are creating a piece of code. So I'm saying the code that I provide as a result of the macro is take the string literal and invoke the dot r method on it, and I wrap everything in the constructor for expressions. And this whole my macro type checks and does the right thing. And so we can actually uh, use uh, the, uh, the uh, regular expressions as before. So here's an example where everything works. But if we do, sorry, if we do um, uh, something invalid, again, we missed, uh, uh, missed some bit of, uh, of the regular expression, then the compiler tells us, okay, this is a wrong regular expression. Here's the, uh, the error, and this is compile time error. So nothing happened at run runtime. We didn't actually invoke a regular expression. We didn't actually fail, fail the runtime. We managed to teach the compiler how to analyze the regular expressions at compile time. So we actually achieved our goal. Okay. So uh, let's move to something slightly more complicated. Um, so in the previous part, uh, we were using various writers to write uh, JSON uh, for uh, strings, lists, and various standard types. Uh, so suppose you, that you want to write as JSON something more complicated. For example, you have a custom case class that you want to write. So you have this case class with three fields, and you want to write it as JSON uh, uh, and some for some uh, serializ uh, serialization purpose. And so we can write. You can create a writer on your on your own. So this is the implementation of a writer that actually converts uh, instances of terminators into JSON. So we're doing something pretty mechanical. We go over each field that we have in in the terminator uh, case class. We write the name of the field. We tuple it with uh, JSON of that field. Then we go over all the fields, create a list, and wrap it in a JSON object. And this is quite mechanical. I mean, I, I can actually describe the algorithm as just I just did as as a, a loop that goes over uh, all uh, all the fields in in the case class. And but once you wrote this thing, uh, you have to maintain it. So if someone renames uh, the dangerous field, well, you have to rename it here as well. And nothing actually stops you from forgetting forgetting to rename the thing and actually have some some error. Or if someone removes a field or adds, no, removes a field actually, okay. If someone adds a field here, I might forget to add it here as well. So it's it's a classic case of boilerplate and something that you would like to avoid. So writing this code is something that that's probably un, uh, not recommended uh, by any means. And we can actually avoid it without any uh, a, 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 any magic, say, like reflection. But uh, unfortunately, uh, in Scala, we have no standard means of kind of operating on case class uh, mechanically during compile time. You, you can't actually just use plain Scala to just iterate over fields of a case class uh, safely. So let's teach the compiler how to do that. Uh, and the macro is, is actually a valid use case here. There are plenty of macros like this uh, in the wild. Uh, so we again start with the various boilerplate here, which I won't be getting into. But the important part here is that I, I have a type parameter a, which is the case class I'm trying to write, and I say that it has a weak type tag, which is essentially the the, the way that the compiler represents the type during compilation. So so this thing lets the compiler actually provide me with all the info I might want. Uh, about the type A, and the result of the whole thing is an expression, uh, a piece of code that is a writer for A's. Uh, and so the first thing we need to do is to obtain uh, uh, a, t a type object. So essentially, it's, it's an object that that contains all the info we want about, about the type, and we can use this object to, to query uh, various facts about uh, about the type that we we're working on. And we'll start with exactly that. We, we'll fetch all the fields that the type contains. So the, the get fields method uh, is not quite nice to read, so I'll skip it. Uh, but you can see the full code in the repo. But uh, it, it accepts the, the type um, identifier here and it provides me a list of the, uh, all the fields that this ca case class contains. Okay, So essentially, I just go over the constructor of the case class and just provide a list of terms. Now now that I have the, the fields in hand, I can actually use them to uh, to implement my, uh, my macro. So before we had code that uh, mapped each field to, to a JSON write. So here we say, OK, for each field that we have, create a quasi code, so a new piece of code that we're writing at compile time, which takes the field name, the, the string representation of the field name, uh, tuples it with the JSON write, and then we do value.field. So value is not defined yet. We're creating a piece of code, and value would be defined later. But this is very similar to the code we had before. We, the value there was the, the instance of the terminator. But here, we are about to provide some generic value that will be the case class. And so we can choose a field on it. So th these are just the, 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 uh, the core part of, uh, of the macro, so essentially the part that uh, actually writes something as JSON. But then we have to wrap the whole thing in an actual writer. So we create a new writer. We use the type identifier that we have here to actually indicate that this is a writer of the right uh, 
type. Notice that this whole thing is a piece of code. So quasi quotes actually generate new code for us. And then we implement uh, the right method you, you, saying, OK, we got a value. So this is the same value as, as we have in here. Uh, that has the type that we have from here, the A type. And then we splice the, the, all the writers that we had here, we splice them uh, into our JS object. Now, the syntax with the double dots here is what allows me to kind of un unwind the, the list into, into the code. And so this actually, uh, the code that we had be from before, but written generically operating on any case class that we might provide for it. So we, we really did iterate over all the fields in the case class and really did write a JSON for each field. And uh, so we can invoke this, uh, this new macro. So it's quite simple once you actually finished implementing the macro, the whole thing is quite simple. So you, you just uh, say, I want a new writer for Terminator and then in the background, uh, the compiler tell, uh, invokes the macro, uh, iterates over uh, all of the fields in our, uh, in our case class, creates the new code, writes it for us, and it's pretty much equivalent to what we, we've written manually before, but we didn't have to write it. Now, and we don't have to maintain it, and now we are guaranteed that the code is coordinated with the actual definition of the case class. We can't do pro, uh, typo, uh, typos in the names or forget some field or whatever. And so if we try to use it, it does the right thing, which is, well, JSON. And you can see the full example for the whole thing that compiles and does it uh, in the repo form for this doc. But yet again, the point here is that we, we want to, wanted to teach the compiler something new. And in this case, we use the macro to teach it. And now it can use it, this new knowledge, new, new abilities to actually do something for us. So mission accomplished. So as I said in the beginning, macros are to be avoided. And if you can, please avoid writing macros. So there are some alternatives. Uh, Shapeless, that I mentioned before, has some very sophisticated macros that, uh, that are created so that you don't have to use macros, and they expose uh, various APIs that allow you to use implicits and types to, to do some of the things that macros allow you, so we can avoid some use cases of macros using Shapeless. Um, there's a, a, a newer technology for doing metaprogramming in Scala called Scala Meta. It's not a full replacement for, for macros, but it, it's supposed to be more civilized and easier to use for the use cases where it's relevant. Uh, sometimes macros are not enough, or you just want something that an ID can handle better, and code generators can be, can be useful in this case. They're a bit cumbersome to use, but, yet, but still are, can be useful. And hopefully in some future version of Scala, maybe we'll have non-experimental macros that won't be as, as scary as the current, um, current implementation. So this concludes the, uh, the macro part. So uh, to conclude, uh, the compiler is not your enemy. Um, if you if you try to actually communicate with it and and teach it stuff, it can be very helpful and useful in your development process. We've seen three methods, three main methods of communication. So types, which data state uh, facts for the compiler, and the compiler can keep track of them. Uh, we have implicits that allow us to teach the compiler uh, various rules that it can use to derive new uh, new values for us. And macros, as a last resort, again, uh, with which we can teach the compiler. Uh, to do some completely new things. And with all, all of these tools in hand, you can actually share your various thoughts about your code base and teach the compiler what you know uh, about your own code base. And in return, the compiler will be helpful and will actually guide you towards better implementations and catch bugs for you and derive new values. Um, so I think it's a, it's a fair trade-off that's very worth the effort. Uh, the full code and the presentation is available here. You can uh, experiment with the code. Uh, and do whatever you want with it. And this concludes this talk. Questions? Uh, hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to know that uh, uh, by implicit, uh, you are doing some um, uh, teaching the compiler at the wrong time, what is the facts, what is the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the macro part, and uh, just uh, maybe you are just demonstrating the facts part, you are teaching the facts. Uh, I want to know uh, how can you do that to in the macro to achieve automatic uh, derivation? Yes, you can. And there are many libraries that use macros to derive various type uh, implicits or type classes uh, automatically. For I know for JSON there's uh, there are add-ons for Cersei and for uh, there's scala that derivation there are lots lots of libraries that use macros uh, in the background to to allow you to derive various implicits so 
it does happen. It, it's, it's a more advanced use case. You probably won't be writing one in your own code base. You prefer it to be in a library because it's, it's quite hard to get a robust macro uh, done correctly. So uh, how do they achieve it? They write implicit, so also in the macros? Uh, there's something called implicit macro, which kind of when the compiler looks for implicits, uh, it takes the macros into account and, and the, the macro can kind of point the compiler to a new implementation that it just generates on the fly. It's, it's not a simple feature of the language. I'm no expert, but you, you can read about implicit macros and, and there are libraries that use it. But again, th they're quite hard to get right. So you, you, you'd prefer to use a library that is actually well tested and not do it on your own because uh, bugs in macros are quite quite frustrating. So the code here is was very simplistic and is not as robust as something that you would use for real production code. So um, OK, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, um, first, s more of a basic questions about macros. I haven't been writing them um, yet. Good, don't write them. <laughs> Continue doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you showed them you just like a uh, method. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering where you actually define this so it knows that it gets executed at compile time. So, so uh, when I... Uh, one Maybe moment. I missed something. Yeah, so, so uh, you need to start with, sorry, with this. So you have a method that oh. you want to implement, and you say, this is a macro. And the compiler takes this in, into account and then expands the implementation as a macro. Oh. So you signal to the compiler with a keyword, which is dedicated to this okay, purpose. Okay. okay, good. Thanks. I missed this part. And okay. another question is um, uh, regarding your first slide about the method which accepts multiple integers. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we encountered, <laughs> encountered this problem as well um, in our team. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can solve it by using value classes. So you show so, an example. Okay, so, so I avoid, so, so this is essentially a value class since I'm wrapping a single value with the case class. You can do this with extends any val and th this is, so it doesn't change the concept. You still have a dedicated type for, the, for a single concept. Uh, any val does give you some performance optimizations where, where it tries but not always succeed, uh, succeeds in avoiding allocations. But this is kind of orthogonal to the idea of, okay, I, I'm, I'm showing a new concept. How it's implemented is something else. So typically you'll have extends any val here, or you might even use something more advanced, which actually manages to, to avoid allocations. But uh, the principle of the thing is that you want a new type per concept. How, how exactly you implement it, whether you use any val or not, is for me at least is kind of a secondary, a secondary concern, where if you see you have performance problems with having too many wrappers, uh, you might consider adding any val or using some other technique to avoid the locations. But for me, safety is kind of the first thing and then performance is the second. So oh, it's a trade-off, okay. obviously. Thank you. Um, and can you actually also use overloading with uh, value classes? Uh, overloading I mean, in the method? If you have a method, uh, two methods with the same name, mm -hmm. if you can uh, use the different parameters by using a value class as yeah, well, so because the representation runtime is, uh, let's say, integer. Uh, so if with any vals, I, I, it might be possible that the compiler won't allow it, but I'm not sure about yeah. the, the intricacies of using any val. I kind of okay, yeah, just... Okay, this is what I also want. Sounds, so sorry. Maybe you know. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. About um, the allocation runtime, uh, in Scala 2.13, there should be opaque type, uh, and uh, uh, there is a uh, working process that should avoid totally the runtime cost of allocation. Yeah. So this technique should be free and even simpler in the next version of Scala. So just use that, and in the next version, switch to op op opaque type, and it would be fine safe no performance later. Yeah, but uh, again, I would like to stress it. If, if you're thinking about performance with this sort of thing, please prove to yourself that there is actually a performance problem there. You know, benchmark, profile, I don't know, whatever, because trying to do like going through hoops to optimize performance before you actually know you have a problem is obviously not the best thing. So I, I prefer to first focus on, on what you want to achieve uh, as in safety and communication with the compiler. And then if you have problems, then optimize using whatever method you can find. So, yes. thank you. Any more questions?
Uh, thank you. Uh, about uh, this, do you use it for every uh, field of an entity, typically, or just uh, wh what's your... Pre uh, so pretty much everywhere I can, I spread them. I, I, I wasn't kidding when I said it one was one of the most useful thing, things I did in a, in a code base, because because that really helps tracking stuff. So we, we had lots of IDs, we had lots of small like uh, strings that represent something uh, which is very specific, and, and we were mixing them up all over the place, and it was hard to follow. And so pretty much every new concept that you ha have, and if you're doing like domain-driven stuff, so every entity in your domain, uh, every every new concept that you, you can think about, if you can, wrap it and make it distinct for the compiler so that the compiler can track it and you can track it. And so I'm, I'm very liberal with just doing it all over the place. It's sometimes a bit annoying that you have to wrap and wrap sometimes, but but it's I think it's worth the effort. So Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. And thank you.